Okay, so I wanted to use this opportunity to talk to you guys about Aquatint. Um, I don't think we will necessarily get a chance to do Aquatint this semester, but I feel like it's really important to a full understanding of etching as a process. So I wanted to uh, make this little video to talk to you about how and what an Aquatint is. You guys might remember this plate uh, that we were working on early this semester. And here is a uh, proof that we pulled of it before everything went, went down. I guess this is up now. Um, and so what we're going to be doing is um, this is a process where we want to actually have the line etched first. And so Aquasin is going to give us the illusion of a smooth tone instead of just lines. And it's something that we can add on top of the plate after the lines are bit. Um, I pulled out this example from the archives. Um, and this is a print that does both line and tone. And it might be hard to see in the viewfinder, but you can actually see that the little scritching lines, those are your basic line etch, what we've done in the past. But these kind of flat tonal areas are achieved through Aquatint. And so that's what I'm going to be showing you right now. One of the characteristic looks of Aquatint is this kind of, I like to call it paint by number, where if you, um, you can really see the sort of edge between the sort of light area and the dark area. And that's caused by progressively blocking it out with hard ground as you bite the Aquatint to different depths. So um, this plate, what they did is they put the Aquatint over the hole image after their line etch was done, and then they decided what they wanted to be their lightest bite time. Um, it looks like this area right here is their lightest bite. Um, it could be, um, so what they did is that before they bit anything, they went in with um, a little bit of hard ground on a small brush and painted this area out. Then they put it in the acid for a very short interval of time, rinsed it off, pulled it out, and then painted out the second tone. Right, and then rinse it, then put it back in the acid, etch it again. So this is cumulative. So they etch it a little bit more to get this second, this next tone, and so on, all the way up to the rich blacks. Um, there is a sort of hard limit to what you can do with Aquatint here. Um, you cannot etch it forever, or you will etch your little dots off. So there's kind of a sweet spot in the range of how you can, um, how deep you can go. Um, and some tricks to getting it to get really fully black. Um, but let's, let's talk about putting an aqua tint on this plate. Um, so this plate, I've went ahead and I degreased it. So it already has its lines on it, if you can see that, sort of. Um, and um, I've already degreased it. So there's no fingerprints or anything like that. And what I'm doing right now is um, I'm here in the print shop. I'm alone in the print shop. And I went ahead and I turned on the hot plate. So um, to melt an aquatint or traditional rosin aquatint, you want the hot plate to be at about 400 degrees. So it takes a little while for our hot plate to heat up to that much. So um, I went ahead and turned it on now. And hopefully it'll be hot enough by the time I pull the aquatint plate out of the aquatint box. Okay, so let's go into the back room and I will show you the aquatint box. Oh yeah, going for a ride. Okay. So back here we have our aqua tint box, which is free for use. So let me um, figure out where I can set this camera. Oh boy. That. That's not good. <laughs> oh boy. I'll just hold it. That'll be great. Okay. So, um... We have these cardboard plates here, um, and this is something that I can set my, um, oof. Hi, so I've made a sort of aqua tint sandwich setup. So this is a cardboard backing. This will help me take it in and out of the aqua tint box. Then I've got a piece of paper underneath my plate. This will help me pick up the plate once the aqua tint is on without touching the plate and disturbing the aqua tint. Um, it also helped me take it off the hot plate without touching the hot melted aquatint. So um, this is my recommended setup 
for before you go into the Aquatin box. But let's take a little second to look at the Aquatin box. So everybody shops Aquatin box is a little bit different. This is it's usually a sort of homemade, home brewed machine. So ours has a little paddle wheel at the bottom, and let's open it up and see what we got here. So flip this open. We've got a grill, and let me lift this up. Excuse me. All right. So I've lifted up the grill. And then you can look down in the Aquatin box and you can see our paddle wheel. And with this particular box, we found that the Aquatin dust, which is um, rosin powder, basically what you would use on your violin strings, tends to get stuck to the sides here. So what I like to do before I do my Aquatin is I like to go into the box with my tool and just sort of push the Aquatin dust kind of down towards the paddle wheel. Just as if it's stuck to the sides, what happens is when I spin the paddle wheel, it doesn't create a very good cloud of aquatint, and that's what I need. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to lower this, um, the grill. Okay, now I'm set. So I'm going to go ahead and close the box. And I don't want to set in my um, plate until I've made a cloud of aquatint rosin in the box, and then I'm going to put the plate in. So here we go. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to spin the paddle wheel a about 30 times as fast as I can. Good enough. Um, and what that does is it's going to make a big cloud in the Aquatint box. And I like to give it a couple of seconds just to let the big particles fall. And then I'm going to set this in. You can see there's a cloud as I open the box. In you go. And now I'm going to set the timer for 10 minutes. Now. Depending on the Aquatin box that you have, the times might vary. So this is, this is um, 10 minutes is good for our box, but it might not be good for uh, any box that you try. So just see, you might need to do some tests to get familiar with whatever box you're working with. Okay, so 10 minutes have passed. I'm going to take my Aquatin plate out of the Aquatin box. It is not advised that you try and breathe the rosin powder. So now that the plate is out of the Aquatin box, I want to look at it now to see if there's a good um, layer of Aquatin on the surface of the box. So one of the other reasons why we put this tray down before we put it in the box is that as the Aquatin falls, the air currents tend to uh, land differently at the edges than they do in the middle. And so having a border that's larger than your plate means that the aquatint dust that falls on your plate is falling more evenly. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at it kind of on edge. Here, you can look with me. And you really want to see this kind of like kind of smooth, velvety, flat kind of surface. Like your, your car has been generously dusted with pollen. And you want to check this before we melt it because when it melts, it becomes transparent. So now let's take it over to the hot plate. All right, so here it is. I'm gonna pick it up using this little bits of paper and set it on the hot plate. All right, so um, if you look at it from the side here, and you may not be able to see that through the viewfinder, but you can actually watch the, um, the rosin start to melt. Oh, I can see it here. Let's see, can you see how it's starting to change in the middle of the plate? That is the rosin melting. And I like to stand here on this side of the plate because the light is better to see it. Um, and this shows me that the plate has a little bit of a belly in the middle. The middle part is touching um, and the heat is sort of spreading out from that point. And I can just see the rosin melt. So this, the hot plate heated up 
fully and so it's melting pretty quickly. Um, you could do this with an open flame and a clamp if you are feeling adventurous. Um, you can also do an aqua tint with spray paint and I will talk about that soon because that's more likely to be something that you have at home. So now it looks pretty much melted but our sort of safe bet is to just give it another uh, you know, 30 seconds after it looks fully melted to just make sure that it is actually fully melted. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll pull it off and cool it down on our cooling stone. So, let's see. I think, I think we're good. Don't try not to touch the hot plate, it'll burn you. And there it is, cooling down. Um, so once it's cooled to the touch, I can work on it immediately. So for my first block out on this particular plate, what I want to do is I want to, um, first I want to think about everything that I want to be white. So on this particular image, um, I'm going to have two colors. So this area here is going to be green and this area is going to be orange. That was my original plan. And I think that it'd be helpful for me to do the green aquatint first. So I'm going to be etching everything that's green. And there's the sort of green of the stem. There's some little elements of green up in the flower. And I'd like to do some more sort of amorphous type descriptions of green shapes in the background. So um, I'm going to start out with what I want to have a really hard, firm block out. So with this particular plate, I'll probably be using more than one tool. Um, but for the hard, like strong block out, what I want is a little brush and a little hard ground. Now you can actually do this with Sharpie, but we've found that the Sharpie doesn't survive very long in the acid. So um, you just want to make sure that you have enough, uh, fresh enough Sharpie to really cover that. So I've got a little jar of Charbonnel hard ground and, um, or stop out varnish, good enough. And I'm gonna go in and paint out a couple little petals so you can see that. And I don't have to go on super thick. If you recall from your last project, even if a little bit of plate is showing, it's going to fully block the acid. Even if it's just sort of like a bronzy shade, that's enough to block the acid from touching. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that I do not get to make a mistake here. And I just want to be really careful as I apply this, because if I apply the hard ground outside of the area that I want to, if I try to correct it, I'm going to be removing both the aqua tint and the hard ground. So sometimes people will have trouble with the hard ground and they'll make a mistake and they'll be like, oh, it's bad, and they'll try to smudge it back in. It's much better to um, work through the mistake in a, in a second layer, right? Like you can always, um, after you've done your first bites, you can always put a new aqua tint on and correct a spot. But just be really conscientious of like how I, if I manipulate this on the plate at all, that will then cover up and block out these aquatin dots. And so just really, and so what I'm blocking out now are the parts of the plate that will stay totally white. And I would like a little bit of green everywhere except for in these flowers, right? So I'm just going to kind of carefully go in and block out the flower petals. Okay, um, yeah, this might take a minute. Um, but I've also pulled out my, um, this little stubble of a crayon. Um, this is a litho crayon, and so this is another really good tool to do block out. I'll make a little bit of mark with this, and you can see the kind of mark it makes, because um, I'm going to cover this up again with hard ground. You can always layer the hard ground on top. But if you want to do a block out that's more, um, 
looks more like a drawing in its own self and less of this sort of like hard paint by number edge that you get with the hard ground. You can use something like a litho crayon to block out in uh, a more of a textured way. So for this particular plate, my plan is to do a lot of um, litho crayon block outs in the background area for a softer look. And I want a harder look in my petals. So the fact that I put that little bit of litho crayon there on this one petal is not going to be a problem. I can just you know paint on top of that. Everything is good. Everything is fine. Yeah. So um, just kind of go in there and paint it out. Yeah. And that's going to give me more of a like firm, hard block out. Last, I get questions about um, etch times and what the Aquatint looks like. So um, this is a test plate that Karen made. Um, we're, we're doing the same process on this plate that we're doing on the print that we're making right now. But instead of making a drawing, we're just blocking out little like rectangles, one at a time. Um, I want to make sure you guys notice that this is indicated in seconds and not minutes. So the Aquatint melts like bites really fast compared to the line etch that we're familiar with. And um, so here we have 5 seconds, 15 seconds, 45 seconds, and you can see that we're moving up exponentially in time, but I'd recommend um, just sort of figuring out like how long you would want to bite something. And um, if you're working with an uh, acid bath on your own, just know that they change from one bath to the next. So this is for a, um, a zinc plate in a nitric bath. And I found that the zinc plates bite a lot faster than say a um, copper plate in a ferric bath. And so um, these times are our times for the shop, which will not be your times if you are able to sort of, if home brew a system. I want you to notice here at four minutes though, it stops getting darker and it starts to get lighter. And I mentioned earlier how you can actually uh, bite off your dots. That is what's happening here. And not only, you may be like, oh, I kind of like the look of that texture business. Um, the problem is, is that this texture is now really fragile on the plate because those dots have been undercut so much that as I was to, if I was to print this plate more, this area would not be stable and would be likely to change from one impression to the next. And so um, you really want to be careful not to etch the plate to this point. Um, the three minute bite time is a much more reliable black here or the three and a half minutes. But this is starting to be, the four, four and a half is starting to be in the bad zone. So just be careful about that as you go through. Um, So that is your basic introduction to Aquatint. Um, it's a process that um, can be a little fussy, but can sometimes be more, kind of more than you expect. I think Aquatint is one of the most beautiful processes in etching because it has the ability to surprise you and do something that you didn't expect. All right, and I um, just want to say, guys, be careful out there. I really miss having you all in my class in person. And so I hope you guys are doing okay. And I know we can't actually do Aquatint the way we have planned to do, but I hope you guys enjoyed learning about it anyway, even if it is kind of more abstract. <laughs> than if we were in person. So um, take care, be well. Hopefully I'll see you guys sooner rather than later.